The X-20 Dinosaur may be the greatest space bomber that never came to be. This single-pilot reusable space plane was envisioned to reach the Earth's orbit and glide across long distances until it landed unpowered on a runway. This would have resulted in an aircraft that could have been able to engage in an intercontinental nuclear strike mission or fly undetected in reconnaissance missions. The dinosaur was conceived after decades of research by pioneers in liquid propeller rockets and hypersonic flight, much of it initiated by Germany during World War II. These men dreamt of a plane that could take off from Germany and bomb the U.S. in a matter of hours. Years later, with the German scientists now on their side, the U.S. Air Force expected to use the dinosaur as a weapon against the Soviets. During the plane's development, astronaut Neil Armstrong became a key figure in figuring out how pilots could eject the glider if the rocket ever exploded. The project was far more advanced than other human spaceflight missions of the time. Still, despite its promise, the project was brought down by politics. The dinosaur never had one specific objective, and no other benefits could be found for military purposes, at least publicly. Hints of the design lessons learned from the X-20 can be glimpsed in DARPA's secretive X-37 that's orbiting the Earth today. Austrian Eugen Zanger, an expert in liquid-propelled rockets, dreamt of a future in which commercial flights could travel the upper stratosphere and reach the opposite side of the world in an hour. In the late 1930s, Zenger and mathematician Irene Brett came up with the concept of the Silbervogel, a rocket-powered suborbital bomber for the German Luftwaffe. The bomber was meant to launch from Germany, attack New York, and land in the Pacific Ocean. For this, it would fly in short hops, and then fire up a rocket engine and climb to an altitude of 90 miles. Then it would soar down into the stratosphere and be lifted by air density. The Silbervogel was never produced because of its complexity and cost. Still, the concept paved the way for the development of the first space planes. After the war, German scientists Walter Dornberger and Kraft Erika were brought to the U.S. in Operation Paperclip, and they began working for the Bell Aircraft Corporation. They developed the Bummy, a rocket-powered vehicle similar to the Silbervogel, but with a vertical launch. The prototype was envisioned as an aircraft useful for research and reconnaissance. Eventually, the Bummy project was separated into three programs. One of them was Project Highwards, which was focused on hypersonic weapon research and development. The programs were later consolidated and came to be known as the Dinosaur Project. It was also a successor to the X-15, a hypersonic rocket-powered aircraft. It was in October of 1957, just days after the Soviet Union had launched the satellite Sputnik 1 into orbit. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NASA's predecessor, held a convention in California to discuss the future of high-speed flight research. The U.S. Air Research and Development Command proposed a three-phase program to create a vehicle that could carry out bombing and reconnaissance missions. This rocket-powered prototype would be boosted into the sky at nearly escape velocity and enter an exo-atmospheric trajectory. After it re-entered the atmosphere, it would bounce or glide upwards with its lifting body and wings. The nickname Dinosaur was selected as a reference to the dynamic soaring landing profile of the project. The first stage would develop a research vehicle. The second would focus on reconnaissance. The third stage would create a bomber version of the spacecraft. It was expected that the Dinosaur would carry out its first glide tests in 1963. The aircraft with a functioning weapon system was to be shown in 1974. The plan was to launch the Dinosaur from Cape Canaveral in Florida. In 1958, 13 companies competed for the project's contract. Bell had been working on similar designs and research for six years, which made the company a pioneer in the subject. But the contract was granted to Boeing thanks to their concept of passively cooled structure. The partnership of Martin Bell was assigned to build the booster. Still, after the contract, there was considerable uncertainty about the purpose of the dinosaur as the priority shifted from military applications to suborbital hypersonic flights. As the project evolved, the vehicle was seen as the potential first spacecraft of the United States. Such uncertainty was evident in the project's X-20 designations. Even though X-planes are used for testing and experimentation, there was hope that the dinosaur would drop atomic bombs from low Earth orbit. The original design by Boeing was modified until it looked just like the glider proposed by Bell. Unlike jet fighters, the dinosaur had a round shape to withstand the shockwaves during liftoff and landing. Since regular wheels would catch fire during re-entry, retractable wire brush skids were developed by Goodyear to allow the plane to land on any runway. Its hypersonic lift-to-drag ratio enabled it to divert from a planned landing and still be able to land anywhere between Alaska and Ecuador. The design became increasingly heavier until reaching a range between 8,000 and 11,000 pounds, depending on the configuration. It had a wingspan of 20.8 feet and measured over 35 feet in length. And because it was three times as big as other space capsules at the time, a larger launch vehicle was required to boost it. The X-20 had a clean and functional cockpit for a single pilot with an equipment bay located behind it, which could be adapted to fit an extra passenger. In total, the dinosaur could carry up to 10,500 pounds at launch. Trying to design a powerful enough booster led to many complications and delays for the program. 
The Titan 1 and 2 used the same rocket engines as the X-15, but were insufficient to lift the dinosaur off the ground. Eventually, the Titan 3, equipped with two upgraded 10-foot diameter motors, was selected as an adequate booster that could carry the dinosaur into low Earth orbit. Plans called for the glider to remain attached to the Titan 3 until it reached orbit. Then, complicated maneuvers would have been required to change its orbital inclination. The positioning meant that enemies would have a hard time tracking the space plane's overflight path in time, making it a powerful tool for bombing and reconnaissance missions. It was also planned that the space plane could rendezvous with satellites and potentially pursue enemy space-based targets. As the project evolved, the dinosaur was not considered a spacecraft because it would only skip along the atmosphere. Therefore, the design didn't prioritize its capability to become a fully orbital spacecraft. The X-20 would be flown through manual controls and automated augmentations. Inside the cockpit, pilots would find all the instrumentation, life support equipment, and an ejection seat that only worked at supersonic speed. Although the cockpit was considered functional and straightforward compared to other spacecraft, it was still filled with round dials and switches. The space plane would face extreme temperatures due to its ability to reach hypersonic speed and the friction it would face when re-entering the atmosphere. It was theorized the wing's edges could reach 2,822 degrees Fahrenheit and the nose cap over 3,632 degrees Fahrenheit. The dinosaur structure was made of a Rene 41 super alloy, a nickel-based alloy that could withstand temperatures up to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat-resistant ceramic tiles and other alloys were used for the leading edges. The nose cap was protected with zirconium. Meanwhile, internal compartments had water walls that provided passive cooling and greatly diminished the structure's temperature. Researchers were constantly challenged by the design of the space plane. But according to Richard Hallian, former Air Force Chief Historian, the dinosaur was, quote, a might-have-been that never displayed the insurmountable flaws. Since the dinosaur was to be piloted by a human, special considerations had to be made to guarantee pilot safety. Neil Armstrong was one of seven astronauts selected in secret to fly the dinosaur in April of 1960. He was brought into the project to develop an effective abort technique in case the rocket exploded during launch. Ejection was considered impossible because the dinosaur's nose would be facing skyward, leaving the pilot on his back. Another caveat was that the pilot would only be 100 feet above the ground during launch. If the pilot ejected laterally, he would reach the ground before the parachute opened. Armstrong concluded that the only solution would be for pilots to shoot the engine and fly to a safe altitude. Then they could glide down and successfully land the aircraft. Armstrong set out to prove his theory aboard a Douglas Skylancer, which simulated the dinosaur's aerodynamic characteristics. During the test, Boeing reproduced the runway and launch pad at Cape Canaveral, where the dinosaur was expected to launch. Armstrong flew the aircraft over the mock launch port and entered into a steep vertical climb. When Armstrong reached 8,000 feet, he rolled the plane over to glide and land safely. His theory proved correct, but he later admitted to being glad he'd never had to try it on the actual dinosaur atop a rocket. In 1962, Armstrong left the program to join NASA's astronaut corps and eventually became the first man to walk on the moon. In total, the simulated X-20 accumulated over 8,000 pilot hours. During simulated test flights, significant breakthroughs were reached in high-temperature material research and parts of the airframe were already being fabricated. Despite its promise, however, the project lost momentum and the Stage 3 bomber design was cancelled in 1963. Next, the program's military reconnaissance version was cut and the dinosaur development shifted to only focusing on orbital research. Its ending designation of X-20 meant it was to be an experimental vehicle that would never see large-scale production. At the same time, the dinosaur was also facing extreme competition from NASA's Mercury program. Ballistic re-entry space capsules proved far more efficient for the purpose of space exploration. In December 1963, Secretary of Defense McNamara canceled the dinosaur before it ever got a chance to fly. The vehicle had cost an investment of nearly $400 million, but had no clear scientific mission or benefit for the military. The same day the project was cancelled, the Air Force announced the Manned Orbiting Laboratory. This new program called for a single-use space station to house a crew of two astronauts to live in for 40 days. The laboratory, which explored the utility of sending people to space as part of military missions, was also cancelled. After the dinosaur, the Air Force developed other space planes like the Prime, Asset, X-23, and X-24. But by the time the Nixon administration came along, the Air Force had to participate in the space shuttle program and pause to develop its own designs. Had it flown, it is possible that the dinosaur could have become a supply shuttle or space taxi. Instead, the idea of a small space plane didn't reappear in public until the launch of the secretive unmanned X-37 in 2010.